Good evening and welcome again. Um, for those of you who've been here the last few weeks, um, you've noticed I need a cheat sheet. Um, my name is Jim McManus, and I am the new um, Vice President for Strategy and Administration here at Bigelow Laboratory. Introduce myself, by the way, is on my list. Um, <laughs> So thank you for coming, and uh, I'd like to very specifically thank um, lots of our donors and the donations that have gone into helping Bigelow with activities like this that, that we enjoy doing and are very much part of the fabric of who we are. And, and I very much want to say thank you for those. Um, I also want to, this is our last, um, Cafe Sci for the summer, um, and I want to give a special thanks to all the folks who here at the lab have helped out. So you've seen lots of faces over the course of the summer for those of you who've been here, and and are including our speakers like Christoph, who's going to talk tonight, but lots of other folks behind the scenes or greeters and folks like Dana and Kim tonight. Um, lots of folks have helped, so um, I want a special thanks to those. Um, like us on Facebook. Um, I'm still getting coaching on what that means, but, but, but please do that. Um, and tonight is our last Cafe Sci, as I mentioned, and Christoph Apley. Did I say that right, Chris? Close enough is what he's... Um, and the title is, What Happens If There Is An Oil Spill in the Arctic? And I want to tell you a little bit about Christoph. Christoph got his master's degree in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, he then got his PhD in Zurich. Um, from there, he went to Stockholm. So Christoph's well-traveled. Um, after that, he went to Woods Hole. And following his time at Woods Hole, he joined Bigelow Laboratory. And I don't know how many years ago. Two and a half years ago. Approaching three. Almost approaching three. So I'm on three weeks, and <laughs> Chris is working on three, nearly three years. So um, anyway, nothing further from me. Um, have a good evening, and thanks again for coming. Thanks, everybody. Can you everybody hear me in the back? That's good. Every, otherwise, you just have to shout and I try to speak up. So thanks a lot for coming to this last cafe site. It's beautiful weather outside and uh, coming into a room here and talking about science. That's, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. So as scientists, we spend a lot of time in the lab. And uh, it's really exciting to be able to talk to, to people about our science. So I really enjoy that. So today I want to speak about uh, the topic, uh, what happens if there's an oil spill in the Arctic. Um, so uh, maybe first start, Jim just mentioned, like I grew up in Switzerland and there we don't have any oil at all that we produce. We don't have any natural resources at all. So how did I become interested in, in um, oil spill and, and the Arctic? So um, it's actually not a straightforward path. So when I joined Woods Hole uh, about five years ago, uh, I wasn't at all doing Arctic research or anything. I wanted to study bromine isotopes in, in, in seawater, naturally produced things. So it sounds maybe a little bit esoteric, and this might be because it is, but then the Deepwater Horizon incident happened. And we had, my mentor at this time had a, a great experience and great samples there and said, this, this would be a really good chance for you to uh, learn some new things. So and I thought this is a, a great chance and I jumped into the topic of oil spill research. And um, on, on the left here you see how I usually did oil spill research. This is on the Gulf of Mexico. You can go there with your shorts and t-shirts and your work is basically just walking along the beach. So this is a, how a, a field work day looks like and it's a very pleasant. Um, <laughs> and to the right you see how I did oil spill research last year. So we had a little bit more clothes, the temperature was a little bit colder, but uh, I have to say I was really, really fascinated by 
by the environment and the, the possibility to, to do this work. So it's such a, a beautiful environment where I have been and it was a really interesting work. And I want to share some of this work with you. And I structured this talk in, in two parts. So first, I'd like to just talk a little bit about oil in the Arctic um, in general. Uh, we want to make a, a break after this so we can have some discussion and questions, uh, which I would really be uh, excited to interact with you on this interesting topic. And afterwards, I want to talk a little bit about this research that uh, I did in, in, uh, in the Arctic. So, but if we talk about the Arctic, um, it's, most people think it's a cold place, it's a dark place, but everybody here has some kind of different perception what the Arctic is. So I tried to give uh, a few perception what the Arctic might be, and I think all of this perception have some truths, but really the Arctic um, is really comes in very many, many different flavors and every, everything has some truth in it. So first of all, we can just define the Arctic geographically. So what you see here on the screen is a, a map of the Arctic. So we have, um, we are right here. This is Maine, this is then Canada, here is Newfoundland, uh, and Nova Scotia, I mean. So, and we can define the Arctic just by the Arctic Circle, so everything that's north of it. Um, we can define the Arctic by saying um, ty what type of vegetation it has. So this would be another line, would be the tree line where no other trees grow um, above it. This is another definition of the Arctic. And then you see it doesn't really line up well with the Arctic Circle. Uh, back here in, in, in Europe, it goes like a little bit above the Arctic Circle here in the US Arctic, it comes a little bit below the, the Arctic Circle, um, just depending on, on what you define. Some other definitions um, would be more kind of like based on the population that lives there, um, and other definitions just depending on which, which um, organization define, defines the Arctic. So my point here I wanna make is just the Arctic is not very well defined, even geographically not. Um, a second perspective of the Arctic we can, in a lot of people's mind, is that the Arctic is basically a, a nature preserve, a, a wild nature um, that should be preserved like this. Um, it's, as I said from my um, experience up there, it's really stunning and beautiful and, and wild. Um, but on the other hand, it's also, the Arctic isn't just empty and all nature and has never been developed. There are a lot of people that lived there and lived in the Arctic for a long, long time. Also, um, if we think of development of the Arctic, the current talk of oil isn't the first time that we talk about oil and Arctic. Some 200 years ago, we talked of whale oil and Arctic. So the Arctic underwent a lot of development and people movement and um, uh, things like this. So uh, when people talk about the Arctic, some also consider the Arctic, this might be just the, the place that belongs to the indigenous people there. And the Arctic should be governed by, by the indigenous people there. So this might be a, another view of the Arctic. Uh, yet another view of it might be as a place where nations come together and, and solve problem and, and manage and, and uh, manage the resources and the nature we have collectively. This here is a picture of uh, an Arctic Council meeting. Um, since 30 years, there is this uh, international organization called the Arctic Council, um, where the eight Arctic states came together and said, we wanna in peace um, talk about issues in the Arctic and solve issues that, that come up. And uh, an interesting thing about this is, so this, uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council rotates every two years, and currently the U.S. has the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So in the Arctic Council there are the eight Arctic nations plus the uh, permanent participants, which are the indigenous people representations, plus there are several observing countries and, and NGOs. So, uh, the Arctic Council is actually really interesting for Maine. So this year, in September or October, a lot of Arctic officials come to Maine because one of the major 
Arctic Council event is going to be in Portland, Maine. So the senior Arctic officials from all over the world come, come to Maine. And this is the first time that an Arctic Council meeting actually happens outside of the Arctic uh, Circle. So the US wanted to demonstrate Arctic is not just about Alaska. The Arctic is a topic that should uh, be interesting for, for all of us. So watch out for um, events surrounding the Arctic Council in, in September and October. Um, a lot of the meetings are closed, but there is a, a wide variety of events that are surrounding this Arctic Council that uh, you can get more information about the Arctic. But this will be just like another perspective of the Arctic is kind of like, this will be the, the model how we should solve conflict and come together uh, as a nation. Another perception of the Arctic might be this is the new resource frontier um, that will allow us to um, get all the energy we need, uh, the, the energy demands of the increasing population. So this is a map here from, uh, from data from the USGS to determine where are undiscovered oil resources, oil and gas resources in the Arctic. So the dark purple one all around here says this is, there is 100% chance of finding oil and gas in, in these formations. And you see this is a, a lot of these areas here are colored dark or light dark. And uh, in effect, there has been operation going on in the Arctic to try to find this oil. You might have uh, heard in, in the press from Shell that uh, abandoned its test drilling in the Chukchi Sea. They were out here test drilling, and uh, last year they abandoned everything. And also the, uh, the US canceled all the lease sales that were planned for this. So in this area, there is no development going to happen in, in the near future. But um, long term, you still see there is a lot of uh, a big potential. If you want to find oil, you'll probably find oil there. Or off the coast of Greenland, there has some oil been found. Um, then in, in Russia, it's a whole different story. Russia had much more uh, industrial development historically. So there are big oil and gas um, fields there that are in operation or are planned to be operating there. Um, but it's not just the US and, and Russia, it's also Europe. So Norway has pretty active oil fields and there is a uh, oil field that's planned to be online this year. So it's a 70 degree north, uh, the Goliath oil field that starts production there. So uh, Arctic as the new resource frontier that uh, provides energy for the increasing population. That may be another view that, that can be held. And just to remind you that um, the world population is expected to grow significantly over the next, say, uh, 100 years. So it, now we're about at 7.5 billion people. By 2100, we expect to have about 1 point, a little bit more than 11 billion people. So that's an increase of more than 50%. So this would be just like another half of the people sitting here coming in here. So this would be in. Uh, by 2100 and all these people obviously need to uh, need energy for for their daily use the question is just where do we get this energy from the last perspective of the arctic maybe the arctic is a, a big frozen lake that we just discovered it's kind of like our terra nulla um, that belongs to nobody and we can come there and, and explore and maybe we can uh, symbolize this by uh, Russia, there are other, other countries that also wants to do that. that uh, but Russia planted actually a flag on the North Pole with a, a submersible. Um, and, and this was in August 2007 to kind of like symbolically say like, this is uh, our, our land here. But of, of course, it's not true that the Arctic is just a newly discovered ocean that we now can start to explore. The Arctic is uh, very different than Antarctica, which Antarctica is, is a continent, but Arctic is basically an ocean that's surrounded by countries. And, and we have a legal framework, we have the law of the sea that clearly regulates uh, who has what. And there is a process if you want to stake a claim to the seabed and say um, the North Pole belongs to us. It's a, 
rather than fighting this in a war, nowadays you fight it with uh, lawyers and geologists. So you submit your claims stating why you believe this is your part and geologists and lawyers look through this and finally an uh, international organization makes a, a decision. And this is in process, by the way, now. Um, except that the US uh, didn't sign the law of the sea, so they uh, should, should do that eventually. So uh, we have a lot of senators that fight for this and say, like, uh, yeah, we should, we should sign the law of the sea that we can actually start participating in this discussion. OK, I want to stop here now with uh, just the different uh, views of the Arctic and want to um, show you why the Arctic becomes so interesting or why so much attention is, is coming to the Arctic. And I think it's mainly because people feel there is something happening there that never happened before and there is new opportunities open up. What you see here is the Arctic sea ice extent that's based on satellite data. You see where the sea ice is. And here the date of this was 1978. And I can uh, start this animation here to uh, you see how the sea ice shrinks and, and uh, expands just in a yearly cycle. So every winter, everything freezes. Every summer, or more, more uh, accurate in, in September, the sea ice reaches a minimum, and then it extends again. You also see that uh, the more lighter color is older ice. So that means that's ice that survived one cycle and then grew again. So this is up to five years ice. And the dark blue one is just first year ice. That means ice that was just formed, um, uh, that was melted the summer before and then froze again. And one interesting thing you can observe now is as the years come closer to um, 2000 and then below to 2010 and 2011, 12 especially, the sea ice remarkably shrinks every year. You still see that every winter um, most of the Arctic is ice covered, but in summer times the extent how much it shrinks gets um, it gets large and large. So the area that where ice stays is smaller and smaller. Um, and the other thing you can observe is that the thick ice, the multi-year sea ice, that's older than one year, year that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's kind of like washed out here of, of Greenland. And now we're in 2013, which was a, a very minimum. And now 2015. Uh, the extent at this. And if you just plot the annual, um, annual cycle of the ice on a graph, this is approximately how it looks like. We have a, a dark line which represents the average over the last um, uh, 30 years. So like uh, 20, uh, 81 to 2010 is the average here. Then you have the dark blue line, uh, the, the dotted line, which was the year where we had like really small, small area of, of ice. So this was the absolute minimum we had ever. Um, and compared to the average of 30 years, this was a 40% loss of the, the ice cover extent. And also plotted here are this year's data. And here in, the, in May, June, it was like way below the, the 2012. It looks like it won't be a record year for this year, but it's definitely much lower than the average w within the standard deviation. So if you analyze this data, you see the, the, um, the more recent years are all way below the average line. So this decrease of sea ice significant, signifies several things. And one of the things is we can, the Arctic becomes more um, accessible and all the resources we just talked about are more accessible. So you could think of that more drilling interests um, become um, an issue there and therefore there is a higher risk for an oil spill in the Arctic. As I just mentioned, um, the enthusiasm from, from some people about all the oil developing will, will um, come was a little bit dampened by recent years. So recent development looks like the Arctic oil drilling boom is not going to happen um, just in the near future. And one reason is if you just look at the oil price, how it developed the last five years. 
This one here is $100 a barrel, and this is how it was for a really long time. So uh, I remember I gave a Cafe Sai presentation about my uh, oil work in the uh, Gulf of Mexico two years ago, um, and there I remember citing somebody saying, yeah, the oil price is probably gonna stay around $100 a barrel for the next like five, 10 years, and then maybe increase slightly to $120. So these were the projections that people had at this time. And this is how um, the oil companies plan. So they say like, how expensive is it gonna be to develop the Arctic and what revenues can we expect? And if you make a business plan and all of a sudden rather than $100, you just get $40, then you may have to revise your, your business plans. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so this is one reason why um, I think that this oil development is not going to happen um, in, in the near future on a large scale, um, at least for economic reasons. Uh, some oil companies cite $100 would be the, the threshold where they think of going to drill. Some other oil companies say like with $50 maybe it will still be good to, to go, but definitely not with so low um, oil prices like now. Another factor I think is uh, very important was the um, climate change agreements. So here in the background you see last year's uh, Paris Accord where um, all, almost all of the countries on the earth um, came together and said, we wanna limit the greenhouse gas emissions and we wanna prevent the earth for, from uh, getting hotter than two Celsius uh, above the industrial, the pre-industrial average. So all the countries submitted uh, their commitments to reduce greenhouse so the climate wouldn't warm above two degree, or actually the wording was, we should aim for significantly below two Celsius for the future. And there was even word for 1.5 degrees Celsius would be the goal by 2100. What I show here is a graph showing what this would mean for CO2 emissions, so different scenarios. So we're currently here on this uh, purple blue line going straight up and we are at this point where this curve breaks. So this is our yearly emissions uh, on a world base. And if we just continue business as usual, we'll end up by 2100 uh, about four to five degrees Celsius. This may not sound like a lot, but uh, as you may be all aware of, this is like really huge um, temperature differences for ecosystems. Plus this is the average um, increase in, in temperature. So regionally, this may be like very different, especially the Arctic is very sensitive and very um, kind of like experience temperature variations that are about double the amount that the average world experienced so far. So if we have four degrees in, in average, then the Arctic may well warm up by, by eight Celsius. So if we I said in this climate accord, a lot of uh, countries committed to um, reducing their emissions. If they all follow through with their promise, then we are on this red line here. And this will lead, give us to about 3.5 Celsius by 2100. And if a lot of other things happen, in the ideal case to go down to this scenario where we're below two Celsius, as you can see, this means that we basically stop emitting CO2. So it goes towards a almost zero emission scenario by 2100. Um, and all, already by 2050, the re, uh, emissions need to be about half of what they are now. Um, and this is in a scenario where actually the world population is growing and we have more energy intensive um, industries or, or way of life. So I think we really need to take action if you want to achieve this. And I also think it's easy to think of 2100 is, is far away, but we can think of 2050, this is already half the reduction. This is when my daughter is gonna be 35 years old. So this is not so long in the future. So this um, will, will happen. So uh, therefore, zero emissions also mean probably not all oil resources that are in the ground um, are gonna be developed. So this would be the consequence of this Paris Agreement if, if we follow through with these promises. Now we have that.
Okay, this is better. <laughs> sorry, sorry for everybody's ears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said the long-term goal will be to reduce emissions, but if you look at very short-term um, scenarios currently, this is from the um, Energy uh, uh, Agency of, of the US, they make their short-term prediction how much petroleum we're gonna use their projection currently is, in a reference case, it just stays flat. Like, um, this doesn't look like here we're going to see a, a significant reduction of, of petroleum use here. You see some interesting things there that we see uh, a significant decrease of coal and significantly increase of, of um, natural gas, which coal produces more CO2 than natural gas, so it might in effect be a slight reduction of CO2, um, but it's definitely not yet zero um, emissions. So this will be the part of the oil companies. Um, and just before the break um, and before a short video I want to show you, I want to also bring another topic. So the oil drilling is not the only um, source of oil spills we can expect in the Arctic. There is also increased uh, shipping that's associated with like more accessible Arctic. And just as one as example, I was just talking to somebody before, mentioned cruise ships and, and tourism in the Arctic. This one here is a, a luxurious cruise ship called Crystal Serenity. It hosts uh, 1,700 passengers, and it's like the most luxurious uh, vacation you can have. And this ship is currently um, sailing through the Northwest Passage, or attempting to do that. So it, it's a 35-day trip. Um, it sold out two years ago, it planned for two years, and everybody who wanted to make a trip through the Northwest Passage uh, could sign up there. And um, it, it passes along the US Arctic currently. In a couple days it will be in the Canadian Arctic and then going through this Northwest Passage, which you see here, this is all these peninsulas and, and uh, archipelagos going through here, passing through Greenland, and then it will go to uh, New York City. So this is a significant event that this is the first time large-scale tourism comes to the Arctic. So this ship is uh, accompanied by a dedicated icebreaker. It has two helicopters there. It has like specialized radar to look for ice and, and uh, the, the prediction of the ice modeling and everything is really specialized for this. So this is a, a first time that uh, the Arctic is uh, going to be explored for tourism in, in such a way. Um, and let's see how, how they're doing. But tourism is not the only thing. The other thing will be um, just cargo transporting. This is a tanker that goes not through the Northwest Passage, but on the other side of the Arctic, the Northern Sea Route. They uh, have crude oil loaded and they uh, calculated that it takes them way lower, way less time to go from China to Europe if they go through the Arctic than not. So here I can show you a, a little scheme where how the Northern Sea Route uh, compares to the Suez Canal Route. So this is from China going here by Russia, the Northern Sea Route, so this is Norway here, the US and Canada is over here, goes to Rotterdam where most of the goods are delivered. Um, if you take the Suez Canal, you have to go all the way by here pass by India, go through the Suez Canal, the Mediterranean, and then come here. So one trip through the Northern Sea Route takes 35 days, versus the Suez Canal Route just takes 48 days. Uh, or just the other way around, like the Suez Canal Route takes way longer. And this will be a significant saving time. However, also here the enthusiasm that this is gonna be a major thing in the next couple of years to come Last year, only 18 ships crossed this Northern Sea Route, um, compared to the Suez Canal Route, which 15,000 ships went through. So this is really in its infancy, and it's also, as you saw from the animation before, um, you can only go through there in summertime when there is no ice. When there is ice, there is uh, more difficult to go through. And why are ships important for, um, for, to consider for oil spills? Well, if you think at uh, some of the most devastating oil spill in, in US history, 
the Exxon Valdez oil spill um, was definitely one of them. And this was not a, a drilling accident or anything. This was a tanker that uh, uh, leaked all its oil and, and uh, a lot of shoreline was impacted. So ships can also have a devastating Im impact. It doesn't have to be um, oil tankers. It can also be normal cruise ships. They have usually a lot of oil loaded on them. And before we take a little break, I have a, a three minute video where the um, Academy of Science, they commissioned a report to say like, just look at what are the risks of oil spill in the US Arctic and how can we respond to this? And I quickly wanna just show you that I think it gives a great introduction of oil spills in the Arctic. Arctic waters are becoming more accessible. New activities bring opportunities to the Arctic, but they also bring risks. As the Arctic becomes busier, an oil spill becomes more likely. There are an estimated 30 billion barrels of undiscovered oil in the U.S. Arctic alone, much of it beneath the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. At the same time, maritime activity in the Arctic, especially shipping, is increasing. Oil spill response is difficult in any environment, but oil spills in the Arctic waters present even greater challenges. This report from the National Research Council assesses what is known about the potential for Arctic spill response. Perhaps nowhere on Earth are the effects of climate change more apparent than the Arctic. Thawing permafrost is reshaping coastlines. Sea ice, snow cover, and glaciers are diminishing. Ecosystems are under threat. Amid this rapid change, up-to-date information on shoreline mapping, marine weather, and sea ice coverage and thickness is needed to plan for effective and safe oil spill response. Understanding the interconnections among wildlife will help lessen impacts on Arctic species. Laboratory experiments, field research, and experience from past spills have built a great deal of knowledge about the properties of spilled oil, both in temperate and cold regions. We need to continue to advance research into various response techniques. One technique is to encourage the natural breakdown of oil by microbes, which occurs even at low temperatures. This biodegradation can be aided by chemicals called dispersants that break down oil into smaller particles. However, more research is needed to determine the fate and effects of chemically dispersed oil in the Arctic environment. Responders often burn oil where it is spilled. This in situ burning can be very effective in Arctic conditions as sea ice can help collect oil and thicken oil slicks. But in open water, oil will quickly spread too thin for ignition. The mechanical recovery of oil using booms and skimmers to contain oil slicks will be difficult in Arctic conditions with difficulty in deploying resources to remote areas, few approved disposal sites for contaminated waste, poor port facilities for vessels, and limited airlift capabilities. Knowing the location of spilled oil is critical to mounting an effective response. Over the past decade, Advances have been made in detecting and modeling oil on and under ice using remote sensing technologies and autonomous underwater vehicles. The Arctic is remote, geographically vast, and lacking in the infrastructure needed for oil spill response, presenting a significant liability in the event of a large oil spill. Pre-positioning response equipment, such as in situ burn materials or dispersants, at strategic locations would help provide faster response, as would enhancing the presence of the U.S. Coast Guard in the Arctic. There is no one-size-fits-all strategy for Arctic oil spill response. Instead, research is needed to build a toolbox of proven Arctic oil spill response technologies that, together, provide the flexibility needed to mount an effective recovery effort in challenging conditions. So much for that. So let's take a short break and uh, if you have questions uh, and discussion points, that would be really interesting to, to hear from you. Yes. What's the reason for the $40 a barrel drop in oil prices? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to repeat the question so people can, can hear it. So the question is, why did the oil price drop so much to, to $40 uh, dollars a barrel now? Um, so I'm not an economist, but uh, in my understanding, it, it's several factors. One is that the oil price of $100 was um, only for a relatively short time. And there was a long period of time where the price was, was way lower. And then all the emerging economies like China grew a lot and needed a lot of oil and needed more than that was available. So the oil price went up to this $100. And now they're slowing down. So um, we have uh, less demand, so to say. So the price goes down. At the same time, we have uh, like the US, for example, produces more oil than ever before with the events of uh, fracking, for example. Um, and another factor is uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't seem to slow down its production. So they, they're in this OPEC consortium to try to control the oil price. But at the moment, it seems they um, are not really actively fighting to bring the price higher up because their production cost of oil is relatively cheaper than, um, say, some, some fracking oil here in the US. So this might also be an aspect of competition. Um, and uh, maybe a third aspect is um, like there's just like more oil on, on the market at the moment. For example, also Iran can all of a sudden produce more oil. So the embargo has been lifted. So more, more oil is here on the market. This is my understanding why this oil uh, price is, is low there. So it's kind of like a supply demand uh, thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so the question was whether there are natural oil seeps in the Arctic, like in the, um, in the US, for example, the West Coast, uh, also in the Gulf of Mexico, there are a lot of seeps. And this is often a, a very good point to be aware of that oil doesn't just come in the environment through accidents. So there are naturally seeping uh, oil fields uh, present. And uh, my answer to this question is there are some seeps However, they're not really like the, the budget of how many seep sites there are. It's not well constrained as like the West Coast or the Gulf of Mexico because it's so inaccessible. But yes, there are kind of like around these areas where you see production of oil or, or drilling of the oil, there are seep sites. So that um, might mean that oil is, is naturally also present there. Um, however, it's also often pointed out that an oil spill. And so people sometimes say, well, if you have natural seeps, then what does it matter if you have a little bit more of oil just coming in by accident? Um, and at least in my experience, it makes a difference whether the oil comes slowly out of a seep site or whether it's released um, on a relatively short time scale. Um, but, but the, the um, good point about seeps is uh, there are definitely, uh, so oil is a, is a very good food for a lot of microorganisms. This is um, a very good carbon. And of course, because oil is basically just plant material, they can really thrive on it. So because there's oil in the environment naturally the whole time, um, a lot of microbes can actually specialize on degrading this oil. So also in the Arctic. Yes. Our question. Is there a great deal of uh, urgency to drill in uh, the Arctic now that we have all this glut of oil in the United States and the price has gone down? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this, is this problem of a, an oil spill? I, I understand that the, uh, the cruise boats and things like that uh, could, could create oil problems, but is there a big urgency to drill mm -hmm. out there? Yeah, so I it comes like... A couple years ago, there was all this drill, baby, drill stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't heard that lately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I feel um, at, at the moment, a lot of oil companies are more reluctant. I think there are not many companies that are really very, very active in the Arctic, um, at least in the US and the Canadian Arctic. Um, however, a lot of oil companies point out that their planning horizon 
is longer than just like short-term fluctuation of oil price. So to get a project up and running, it takes decades to complete. So they're kind of like looking at their balance sheet and seeing like how, many oil, how much oil reservoir do I have in the Gulf of Mexico and when will this run out and what do I do next? So I think in the case of the European Arctic, there are um, some companies that feel like, yeah, this is a, a accessible point where we can drill there. I don't think in the US Arctic currently there is a, lo a lot of rush to drill. Um, for the Russian Arctic, I think there it might be that it's not just pure economic um, factors that play into, but also um, some maybe political motivation to, to say like, uh, we want to have a, a presence there and have a certain amount of oil drilled there. So I think uh, maybe not just economic there pressures is there. Is any drilling going on up there now for oil? Yes. So there are um, several sites in, in Norwegian waters that are uh, big platforms that just opened that go on there. There is uh, in the Russian Arctic, there are big gas plants. So not just drilling for oil, but for natural gas. Um, some of them are also just coming online or were planned to come online around this time. Um, I think the whole international embargo against Russia um, get a little uh, uh, back set for a setback for, for this because then um, international agreements with, were more difficult. But the Russians are definitely drilling there. In the US Arctic, um, we shouldn't forget that uh, I'm not just referring to offshore oil, but onshore we have uh, the Prudhoe Bay oil that the Alaska North Slope that's still being being um, kind of like explored there. Yeah. But offshore, US, there is nothing going on at the moment. Hmm. But we still have to worry about the long term and what can happen when mm -hmm. we, we have to go, or other countries have to drill more extensively and worry about the effect on our own. Yeah, so the question is like, do we still have to worry about uh, kind of like drilling in, in the Arctic from, from other countries and so. And I think um, the future is hard to foresee, so <laughs> kind of like how this is. But um, if we follow through with our CO2 emission uh, goals, then uh, we should probably leave a lot of this oil in the ground just from a back on the envelope calculation. But um, uh, I think if it's easily accessible, um, some oil might just be uh, developed eventually. Yeah. Let's do one last question, then I'll move on to the next part. Yes? Isn't, isn't there a um, negative byproduct of natural gas, I can't remember if it's methane, in the short term or the long term, and how does that impact the Arctic Ocean plant? So the question was about uh, what if you drill for natural gas? Isn't there methane, which is uh, kind of like a, a negative uh, effect that, that's happening there? And that's completely right. So the natural gas reservoirs are uh, like methane is a, is a big thing there. And methane, um, if you don't, so it's a gas, so it's easily <coughs> volatile. And this is a very potent greenhouse gas. So if you drill for methane and don't contain all your methane, um, then you actually not just produce a gas that when you burn it produces CO2, but you also release a, a very potent greenhouse <coughs> gas in the atmosphere. So um, making also like more greenhouse gas emissions and a warmer climate for that. Yeah, so that's, that's correct. Um, some uh, oil, natural gas fracking people will point out it's all about technology, we can contain everything, but um, in order to like prevent any methane from leaking, this is I think the technology still needs to come some way to to make that. Good. If you're up for it, I let's now jump into um, my research I did last year in in Svalbard, where we looked at these issues that were just discussed um, in this in this talk uh, in this video presentation. So we wanted to know what are the in impact of oil spills, but also the impact of oil spill technology when we um, 
to the marine environment. And because we are Bigelow and our main focus is in marine microbes, we were specifically interested, what do the microbes do with this? So when oil and the Arctic environment, when oil and ice mixes, it, it's kind of like a different situation than when you're just in an in a open sea. So this is a schematic what all happens to oil when it comes to ice. So oil can either be encapsulated in ice somewhere, it can like drift, uh, it can melt if, if it's on top of ice, it can then percolate through or, or percolate up. And then you have the other processes that can happen to oil that happens also in open water. So the complication with ice is really that you have just a, a more complex system there. Plus then, um, we want not just to understand what are the um, different processes that happen there, we also wanted to understand what is the effect of response technology. So rather than just saying, let's just hope we never have an oil spill, saying if we have an oil spill, what are the best response options we can do? Um, one response would be using dispersant. This is mentioned in the video. Another response option is burning the oil. And a third response option is just skimming off the oil. And for this project, we went to um, Svalbard, which is an island that belongs to Norway. This is Norway here, and this is all the way up in the Arctic Ocean at about 80 degree north. Um, it's uh, an island where there is uh, it's interesting combination of there's some mining activity going on. There is a big university there in terms of students turnaround. And there's also tourism is more and more uh, becoming important there. Um, and there is uh, facilities that allow to test for oil. So how do you simulate the oil spill without contaminating the environment? So this is kind of like our question and our um, uh, partners a uh, team from France came up with an idea to use this mesocosms, they are called. So this is uh, big kind of like plastic bags that are floating that you can lower in the water and where you can spill oil and it's still going to be contained, but it's going to be in the natural environment. So this were our test set up to simulate an oil spill. And um, I'm just going to show you a, a short slideshow now how this whole research uh, went about. So we flew from, from Portland to Oslo um, and then all the way up to Svalbard. And the first thing you see when you come to Svalbard is that it's a very different environment that uh, you know. The Longyear Bean is the main capital there where also the university is. And you start noticing the signs warning you for uh, polar bears. The preferred way of transport is snow scooters, and the North Pole is um, only 1,300 kilometers away. So we then packed all our stuff in a little plane and flew to this little mining town um, called Svea, where we had a lab container where we could do our research. So this was this place where we had our lab set up, and um, we then these were the mesocosms that were deployed out in the fjord. You see here the white thing is all a frozen fjord. Um, our partners drilled holes to lower these mesocosms in it and then let it and added oil and then let it freeze over. And then every month we came back there and took an ice core and analyzed uh, what, is, what is going on there. So. Um, Usually we use these drills you see here to, to get a, a sample of the ice core, then take the ice out, analyze the ice, the bacteria, the, the other microbes, um, and, and see how it changes over time. Um, by the way, it's really, it really was beautiful there when this was now from June. Um, while the mesocosms were deployed, it was all dark. At the time we now sample, it was all light 24 hours a day. This is a sample ice core, how it looked. And then we brought them to the lab, um, let them melt to then do our experiments. We did some incubations. Other people did some microbiology experiments with this. And we also uh, determined which bacteria are active 
and are degrading oil. And to this end, we deployed um, some of these samples in, in Arctic water there. So the temperature there is uh, minus 1.8 Celsius, so it's below freezing point, but because it's salt water, it's still liquid. So we looked how bacteria could degrade oil in, in these conditions. Um, my postdoc at this time, she went out there and, and sampled every day to see how the oxygen draws down. We then uh, analyzed uh, the amount of bacteria there and uh, the amount of uh, hydrocarbons that was present there. A second experiment, we wanted to see how oil is in open water. So for this, we made little holes and where the water came out and then deployed small amounts of oil um, in, in these holes and again, let it just sit in the environment for just a shorter time. This time it was just five days and we were interested in very short term effect of oil. And this is how we sampled then the water layer. We also had some um, contraptions so we could sample the water underneath. And this one here was an oil treatment where we looked at how does the oil develop over there. So, and in, in terms of what we found so far, uh, we looked at several things. One thing is, how does the oil change, does this oil we put in there change over this incubation period of, of four months we put in? Or, or, so we installed this mesocosm in February. This is then how they looked after they were frozen in. And when we went and recovered them again, uh, we could still see that there was oil in all of these micro mesocosms. So the oil didn't just disappear, which was to be expected, but we were curious, like how much does the oil actually change over time? And interestingly, it didn't really change much over this incubation time. But what we were then specifically looking is, well, what not, let's not, not just look at the oil, but let's look at the ice. How does the, the ice and the oil interact. And there is a lot of things that's not known or wasn't known. So this is now an ice core that we drilled there, just like a sample how, how this looks. This was the top of the ice core and that was the bottom. So the bottom is where the ice grows. The top is where we had oil and snow mixture. And in the middle, you see the ice core broke. So we, we didn't uh, break it there. It was just, this is where the oil layer was. So where we originally put the oil, ice grew in both directions. What you can also see is that above the uh, oil layer, this is where it looks very dirty, and below, this looked very clean. So we, this picture was taken before we cleaned the outside of the, of the core. There were still some um, uh, just like artifacts there, but you couldn't, like after you cleaned it, you couldn't see visually any oil moving through this. But we, what we wondered is, is actually this oil layer able to percolate through the ice core and what do the bacteria do that are in this ice? So we took a sample of this ice, put it in these little vials that um, you saw in the slideshow, incubated it for, for 10 to 20 days and observed every day what, what happened. And what we found was that they're actually in the ice, even at this below freezing temperature, there are microbes that can degrade oil. Um, and you could think of like, how can bacteria live in such harsh conditions? So if you uh, like at home put something in your, in your freezer, you hope that no bacteria grows there or eats anything. But this is really the special thing about sea ice. So sea ice has a, this property that it's very porous. So if you, you could do this at home, if you have some fresh water and some salt water and just let it freeze and then add some uh, food color to it, one of them is uh, sea ice and one of them is freshwater ice. And the more porous one, this is the seawater ice. So this forms all these pores because as the ice freezes, it uh, re repels the, the I, the salt out, so this then lowers the freezing temperatures, and in the end you have these brine channels that are very high saline, but there's still liquid water in it. And interestingly, there's really bacteria that are thriving in these conditions. And what we found is that this bacteria can degrade oil. 
However, I mentioned before, at the end of, the, of this um, field experiments, we still saw oil um, floating on top of this mesocosms. So um, we're still looking to, to finalize our data here, but um, kind of like a, a model we have for now is, this is how ice and oil looks um, when, when you have this, this oil layer. So the blue one would be an ice core. Then we had the black oil layer that we put in. And then below here is the seawater. And we did, we also did different incubation. So we didn't just do oil. We also added some dispersant and we added some burned oil residue. And what, you, what we find, what our uh, conceptual model now says is this oil can slow, it, most of the oil stays in this layer, but some of the compounds can like percolate down and bacteria can actually degrade it as it goes down. Another thing I can mention is that um, if you add this person, then more of this oil goes down. And if you burn the oil before you incubate it, then way less oil goes uh, through this, I, uh, way less oil is um, um, mobile here. However, when you come to the ice-free season again, then the oil is, is still floating on top. So um, this will be kind of like our, the, my preview of, of the research results we have so far. So as I said, we are still working to, to finish all these uh, reports, but it seems to be, uh, for me, it was very exciting to see that even in Arctic conditions, um, there are highly specialized bacteria that actually can degrade oil. Um, and with this, I just want to uh, end this presentation and uh, open the floor for some questions or comments. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm So the question was whether um, the dispersants in the, when they use it in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, whether there were research findings suggesting that they have negative effects and can cause uh, um, kind of like some genetic deformations and stuff. And um, so this is the topic of dispersants. And this is um, very controversial. Some people are um, really for dispersants and say, this is a good thing um, because it keeps oil from the shoreline. And other people say it's a bad thing because it makes the water more toxic because it makes little, little oil droplets. So the oil that would otherwise just float on top then is spread throughout the water column. And I think both views have a truth. So uh, the best thing would be not to have an oil spill. But if you have an oil spill, then you have the option of um, letting the oil just be on the top of the water layer and with the risk that eventually hits the shoreline where you might have a very sensitive environment. Or you can try to keep it in the water column and using this person would be one way, but you make the situation worse just at, at this moment then. The hope of this person is that in the long run the bacteria then degrade this oil and in the long run it will be less bad to have this short-term uh, increased toxicity versus having a shoreline oiled. And um, I, I think if you're in an oil spill situation, then you don't have an ideal solution. So you have to kind of like weigh uh, how sensitive is your environment on the shore? How sensitive is your environment um, right there? Yeah. There's a question in the back. So the question was when bacteria degrade oil, what happens af after that? Um, is there a byproduct and then where, so basically where does the oil go after this? And this is a very good point. So for a long time, people just thought um, once you cannot measure your, your uh, oil anymore, then it's just degraded and, and gone. Um, but just recent research suggests that not the oil doesn't just disappear to CO2 and isn't there anymore, but it's gonna be like, 
degradation products that are just not measured at the moment, but that they're still present and they can have effects. And many studies found that um, if you look at oil that is biodegraded or weathered over time, you find that to the toxicity of this oil actually doesn't decrease as fast as you would expect if you just look at the oil compounds you know. So I th that uh, uh, many research suggested that maybe this byproduct may really cause toxicity, but um, there is still things that in research currently, so there's more, more research needed to figure this out. But mounting evidence suggests, yeah, you cannot just look at the oil, you also have to look at the byproducts that are being formed. One more question. Um, right now would probably be, um, in terms of when you can have an oil spill, would probably be uh, more ideal than if you had one in the middle of the winter. Because now you enter the sea ice minima and you could actually navigate somewhere and respond to oil spill. Um, there are some, so it depends where exactly it would be. Um, if it's close to a community that actually has uh, a field, air, landing field and some uh, predisposed material. Uh, people could go up there, respond to the oil spill. It would take, you know, however many weeks it takes for boats to drive up there. Um, and there are not that many boats. So I, I think it would spill for a while before the first responder would be there. And then slowly the response would start kicking in. It would definitely be very different than a Gulf of Mexico uh, spill where you just could hire thousands of fisher boats that were there to help you cleaning up the spill. If it happens in the middle of the winter when everything is iced, then you couldn't even go to where the spill is. So you would just have to wait until the, um, the ice is melted. Yeah, the question is, would they then burn it? Would they disperse it? Or would they kind of like skim it? Um, this is dependent on when they arrive. So for example, for burning, you can only burn oil in a relatively short time window where you still have enough volatile compounds that you manage to ignite it. If you arrive there too late, then you cannot burn it anymore. For dispersant, if it's, if it's in the US, the, it's, general, it's currently very controversial and this person would have to be approved and it's a lengthy process to do that. So they probably wouldn't use this person um, right away. So my guess is that mechanical removal or if possible, uh, burning would be, a, uh, would be the choice. But in the Arctic, it's also, you have the science that suggests what's the best thing and then you have a situation and then you just look what's feasible and what's possible. So you might just do whatever is just feasible there. So I'd uh, like to thank you again all for coming. And before I um, stop talking, uh, I, wanted, I left one thing off of my list and that was to mention that Christoph is the director for our Center for Venture Research on the Opening Arctic. Um, so, one more round of applause for Christoph. Thank you. And again, thank you all for coming and to our frequent